Uh, welcome. My name is Ludovico Fioli. I am the director of the Center for Inter-American Policy and Research at Tulane. And uh, it is my immense pleasure to uh, welcome you to our event today. We have the privilege of having um, Amalia Leguizamón present her book, Seeds of Power. And to help us do that, we have uh, the double privilege of having Toby Miller uh, back with us. Um, and uh, I'm, my role is very simple. I'm going to introduce the two people I just mentioned, and then I'm going to yield it all to them. Um, and um, uh, again, thank you for joining us. And um, just before I get started with the introductions, I guess uh, a little housekeeping is in order. I would beg everyone to please keep their microphones muted um, and to use the uh, Q&A uh, function uh, at the bottom of your screen, if you want to interact uh, with the um, with the panel, um, so uh, Toby Miller is the Stuart Hall Professor of Cultural Studies at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Coajimalpa. He was a Greenleaf Distinguished Chair and Visiting Professor of Latin American Studies at Tulane Stone Center for Latin American Studies in 2017. Prior to these appointments, he was a professor at New York University and the University of California Riverside. Professor Miller is the author and editor of over 40 books and his work has been translated into multiple languages. He writes about the environment, sports, the media, cultural policy and issues pertaining to gender, race and class with a focus on the Americas. Amalia Leguizamón, our own Amalia, is Associate Professor of Sociology at Tulane. She's also a core faculty member at the Stone Center for Latin American Studies and an Associate Research Fellow at CYPR. Her work on the political ecology of agricultural biotechnology has been published in the Journal of Peasant Studies, Latin American Perspectives, and GeoForum, among others. And her new book, Seeds of Power, Environmental Injustice and Genetic Genetically Modified Soybeans in Argentina, has just been released by Duke University Press. And of course, that's why we are all here. Uh, so with, without further ado, I'm going to yield the floor to Toby. Wow, well, thank you very much, Ludovico. It is a great honor to be with you all and in two senses. The first sense is simply because being at Tulane for those months that Ludovico mentioned was an extraordinary privilege and experience for me. And so it's great to be back with cherished friends and colleagues. The second reason is that Amalia's book is absolutely ace. It is brilliant. And I say that not only because she's a dear friend, uh, whom I made as a friend actually during that time at Tulane, but because the book is stunning. So let me very briefly run through what I think is special about it. And then I've got a few questions, Amalia. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and they're tough. They're very, they're very, tough. <laughs> very, very they're rigorous questions about sociological method and things like that. No, but uh, to be serious, this book is a contribution to so many important fields. And one of those fields is understanding. What do I mean by that? Well, there are lots of complex theoretical, methodological, political, social, cultural questions in the book, but the prose is limpid. So whenever something contradictory, paradoxical, tough is engaged, not only is it engaged in a way that the average general reader like myself can comprehend, but more than that, we get a story, an ethnographic story that humanizes whatever complex theoretical, political, ideological question is being addressed. And that brings me to the other field where I think there's an enormous contribution in this volume. Generally, political economy, critical political economy, and ethnography are kept in safe houses rather too far apart, whether we're talking about sociology or anthropology or cultural studies or any of the spheres that try to do those sorts of things. And in general, political economy is on the pessimistic side of things. Oh God, we've all gone to hell in a handbasket. Look at the way that oligarchies and oligopolies are sticky and powerful and they control everything, the state, ownership and so on versus ethnographies, which tend, especially in the United States, to be a little sunnier, uh, looking for resistance, looking for signs of organic articulation from below with social problems and coming up with great answers. 
Now, what's extraordinary about this book is that it doesn't allow those antinomies to be kept separate. Amalia brings them together and allows them into play in an extraordinary way. And as a consequence, she makes contributions not only to understanding and to the apparent sort of dueling twins of ethnography versus political economy, but to environmental studies, to area studies. There are, there's a wonderful capsule history of Argentina, but also of really what could be applied to the vast majority of Latin America, plus to the sociology of social movements. And all throughout, there is this engagement with the present and the past. So it's sociology that understands history, but also understands the present. And I suppose one of the things I like about it is that if you go back to the early 70s, when Laura Nader advised that one needed to study up, and if we, one goes back to the mid 90s, when George Marcus talked about the need for multi-sided ethnography, this wonderful book, Seeds of Power, does both those things. I mean, in addition to a traditional ethnographic concern with the popular classes, particularly women and indigenous people in Argentina. The prof is also taking us on an excursion into the elite. You know, what the local engineers, people working for big corporations and so on have to say. So she does that studying up stuff. And in terms of being multi-sided, she takes us across different parts of Argentina, but also really parts of the world. And in that sense, the contribution to environmental studies reminds me very much of Rob Nixon's wonderful book, uh, Slow Violence, about environmental despoliation, because much of what the professor addresses in this book is in a way visible, things like crop dusting uh, or transformations to seeds, but also slow moving in the devastation as well as the bounty that this brings may not be instantaneous and obvious. Um, so I wonder whether you want to comment on that, Amalia, and then I ask offer some questions, or we want to give people an outline of what's in the book. Um, Maybe a little outline. Would that yes. Be? Uh, first of all, I, I do want to say thank you, Toby, for taking the time for doing this, and to Ludovico Cypher and Tom Reese at the Stone Center and Dinero at the School of Liberal Arts for helping me be here at Tulane and make have this book uh, be possible. And I'm really thrilled. Of, how many people have showed up? And thank you for sending me the little messages. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I'm uh, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but I'm also very, very excited to share this with you, all uh, friends, family, colleagues, because it's been a very, very long ride. Uh, can go my advisor who's there somewhere. Um, it's just a huge pleasure to 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 have this as a real product, and and I appreciate what you said. Think, uh, Toby, about um, the book trying to bring together, to, to pull these different strands, um, because I hope, oh, I'm glad that you're saying that that comes through, because that's something that I was very much struggling to do as I was writing, uh, is to try to bring these very, very macro processes of the political economy and make them real, right? Like, what what is it? Like, we write a lot from the political economy of the environment about people in the global south or women in the global south. And it's like, okay, what does that mean? What do those faces look like? What are the real struggles in everyday life? And how do people navigate those things? Um, and so the idea as, as the book took more shape was to, to, to find a way of speaking, of, of telling a story that could thread all those different strands, um, which is in a way highly, I mean, it's a typically sociological way of thinking, of trying to think of the macro, the meso, and the micro. Uh, but, but um, uh, yeah, so it, it, it is sociological in that sense. And it's also, I think, I like to do it a, a little bit like in a literary style, right? Try to bring all, all these interviews and trying to tell these stories that are, that are, that are more of uh, the ethnographical um, way of writing, right? That how how can I put you in this story with me? There's a there's a wonderful moment in the book very early on, and I'm going to quote just one sentence where you say, "Soybeans are the most ubiquitous crop most people never think about." And because I'm a vegetarian and <laughs> in that sense, not very Argentine, <laughs> in many other senses too. 
I've always thought of myself as somehow rather rather proud when I'm drinking soy or eating okay. soy. <laughs> but it didn't take more than about 20 pages for me to lose that pride, mm -hmm. that masculine vanity as I read the book, because you really do talk about not only the fears and the impacts, as well as the benefits mm -hmm. of the technologization of soy in Argentina, but also made me aware of the environmental impact beyond even the spaces yeah. where these industries are functioning. And I found that to be very, very useful. Perhaps I could, I could kick off the questions now, if I may. One of the things that those of us who've come to learn about environmental justice in US terms need to think about when we read a book like this is that some of the norms of the environmental justice movement and scholarship about it may not exactly apply, may not be mappable onto this situation. And in particular, the fact that there are plenty of people for whom genetically modified foods and specifically crops in your study are seen as bountiful, as positive, and as part of a really important and vital and valuable national heritage. Right? Mm -hmm. Argentina, there's a lot of talk about Argentina, Canada, and Australia being on the same sort of plane a century ago in terms of their agricultural importance to the world. And that this is a way of Argentina resurrecting that status. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about the issue of how to use environmental justice logics and categories from the US, and also about that very nationalistic identification with genetically modified foods, specifically crops, as being so important incarnate in some of the responses that you received from people you spoke to, both at the top and in the popular classes? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, the interesting thing about genetically modified crops I found by, by being here in the United States is that generally, and I'd say generally, and I mean, friends, colleagues, regular people, my students, what we're reading in terms of what environmental sociologists and generally sociologists write is about how bad genetically modified crops are, right? How they do generate this environmental injustice in which the rich, the agribusiness, the corporations get to um, reap the benefits of these crops and then consumers and farmers, campesinos get only to bear the burden of the costs, whether it is because we are we are eating these crops that are contaminated by agrochemicals, or because people are being uh, campesinos, uh, smallholder farmers are are forced uh, are forced to to take up onto into onto these technologies that leave them in debt, um, that that force uh, farmers to sign these contracts that are um, negative to them, right? So. The, the interesting thing for me, or like the discovery uh, towards what was happening with soybeans in Argentina was that I had all this literature inside me from, from Vandana Shiva to Michael Pollan, right? My, Michael Pollan saying how we need to rethink our food systems. And, and in general, the discourse is that genetically modified crops are bad, right? We all agree genetically modified crops are bad. Uh, so when I arrived to study to when I arrived to Argentina to do my fieldwork, I shared this with the agronomists, the soybean producers, and even with regular people. Right? Like, are like how bad are how bad is this thing you're doing? And the the fascinating and striking thing was that people were telling me like, no, we do the best agriculture in the world. This is the best we can do. Like this is the latest of the technological innovations. This is cutting edge. This is bringing all this money to this country. This is what making Argentina great again. And I'm loving saying this, <laughs> uh, but but it does started me thinking into what what did that meant, and and not only for soybean producers but but for rural inhabitants in general and for anyone related. Uh, to the ag to the agro sector is that it slowly it, it very quickly became clear to me that there was a history of technological innovation that is for Argentina that is surrounded by pride and it is this pride this um, 
that is attached to the a guiding myth of Argentina being the granary of the world in the 20th century. And this ties to a history that, that is, um, in a way, long, right? The, it, it ties back to two centuries ago. But for Argentines, it's very present, particularly because uh, Argentina has been, as many know, in like multiple waves of economic crisis ever since uh, late 19. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and then now, right? Uh, but but there is this collective memory of this time when Argentina was great. There was a, in the path of development. This is the time of the first agro export uh, boom in Argentina between the 18th century, uh, 1870 to 1920, right? And and that is that is part of the that is part of this collective memory, right? And so so people. Uh, and I'm talking, and this was the interesting thing that this is not just the large agribusinesses or the rich people, right? But 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 all people, everyone that I met that was somehow involved in 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 the agro business, uh, or or work as an agronomist, or or even lived in the countryside in these rural towns that are doing better now, found a personal tie to this history, and and find, found pride in being the most, once again, right, after that agro-export boom of the turn of the 20th century, now Argentina is experiencing a new agro-export boom that is bringing all, all this foreign income to, to the agribusinesses, but also to the country, right? So they found a way in which to communicate this pride and this, and this success that is not just captured by tiny elites, but is somehow spread through or uh, is trickling through into the communities. And, and we can talk about this later, but also through the government, through export taxation towards the rest of the population. So, so we, we all gain in that sense. Um, so the concept going back to your question of how do we use the logic of environmental justice in the United States? Well, I try to, I try to think about also in the many ways in which um, what well, is probably a longer answer, right? But uh, the many ways in which the concepts don't fully apply, right? Like the categories of race and racism in Argentina are not the same as in the United States, right? So there are many things that we need to be rethinking about like what settler colonialism looks like for the literature and environmental justice. And most significantly, what I tried to figure out was to think about how power operates in the, in the system, in, in, in the dis dis distribution of cost and benefits, most significantly, right? Because at its most basic, uh, a lot of uh, what environmental justice theorists and mostly methodologists are doing are trying to push the methodology of how can we measure this? How can we map this? And it is very, very interesting, right? And very, very important that we're able to map injustice, right? But, but I think uh, we also need to be thinking into what are the dynamics and processes that help explain uh, this. And most significantly, what I'm trying to do in the book is also try to think into the ways in which regular people in their everyday life actually reproduce injustice, right? Because a lot of environmental justice uh, work is focused on the movement, which is exciting. It's very important. Uh, but when you look out the door, this is not what the majority of people are doing, right? Most of the people are not revolting. Most of the people are not, not protesting, but actually trying to figure out ways in which to survive and make a living, even though they are massively exposed to toxicity. Uh, so how can we explain that um, became like the core of the book? And it's a wonderful core, although saddening in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the points about that you mentioned was to do with cost-benefit analysis, which I want to come back to in my last question, if I may. But for now, I wondered if we could focus on that word elites, because you tie very effectively developments today, particularly what Robert Oppenheimer called the technically sweet, when he was explaining why these leftist nuclear scientist guys in the Manhattan Project went ahead with the horror that they were embarked on, because it was a kind of you know, excitement at the money and the technology being possible that meant they lost their ethical bearings. 
one of the things that interests me is if we go back as you do in the book to the 1850s, 60s, 70s, I'm at influence often of British positivists uh, and French positivists against the Catholic Church, against the traditional elites and in favor of their own kind of white masculinity. Very powerful in Argentina, in Colombia, in Mexico, in many parts of Latin America. Mm -hmm. All kinds of good as well as unfortunate impacts. That kind of male lightness of skin and power continues to be relevant in the stories that you tell and in the power blocks that you encounter, but not only in terms of its own social force, but also in terms of the impact it has on others, mm -hmm. as in the trust that those people get from a lot of the rural indigenous folks you speak to. But Mm -hmm. There are these fascinating moments in the book, for example, when you're in a heterosexual household and when the guy is there, no one speaks ill of genetic modification, of fumigation, of soy. But when he steps out, you might be preparing food or washing up with his wife. And suddenly she starts to whisper or begins to say, I'm worried about pregnancy. I'm worried about birth defects. I'm worried about cancer, but in a way that is only half articulated, but is very powerful in the book. I mm -hmm. wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that, about this gender and race element that is running through not just the history, but your personal experiences as you meet these women versus these men, as it were. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, I have to say that that was a very true, um, like when they tell you, you never know what is what you're going to find out when you start your field work. That was the very true moment. Uh, once for me, once I started, um, when I, as, as I said earlier, I landed in my field work wanting to know first why there were no protests against uh, genetically modified crops in general, right? With time I, I realized that or not only there wasn't anything wrong, but on the contrary, everything was great, right? Everything was great. This is what the best agriculture in the world. We all live off the countryside, people kept telling me to tell me about all the many ways in which people benefited from soybean production, right? But, but with time, it started to be also very clear that there was something that wasn't fully mentioned, which was agrochemical fumigations, right? Particularly around Glyphosate. Glyphosate is a herbicide that is used in conjunction with the genetically modified soybeans, right? So that that became a weird silence, right? A, a, a weird non-event in that sense, and and something that started happening, particularly as as I landed, thanks to uh, uh, a friend, I landed into a household where I was fully welcomed there. Like I was staying there and 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 this woman uh, pretty much uh, held me as as a, as a member of the family, right? So, so very quickly and very suddenly, I started having very, very deep personal conversations uh, with, with this group of women that were very close, uh, uh, um, mother-in-law and, and daughter-in-law, right, and, and very close friends. And, and what it suddenly dawned to me is that as I had been traveling the country, doing all these interviews, I had been so focused on the interviews that, that I hadn't been, that I hadn't realized that the interview started when the men, when the women left the room, right? So I had been living in this, in these rural homes and, and I had arrived there with the purpose of knowing about this agricultural technology. And it dawned to me that the men would speak to me about work. And the women, even though we would be hanging out all the rest of the day, at the time that I would turn on my recorder, my, my interviewer, like the women would be like, okay, I leave you for work. And they would leave. Uh, and, and I really like, didn't pay my atten much attention to that until the moment when, um, when I started hanging out with these women a lot. And suddenly these women would take the absences of the men. Like when suddenly uh, 
the people not responsible to talking to me about work were not there, they would like whisper, literally like bring up the, the comments of, oh, I'm worried because I have the, the plants in my garden are dying and, and literally like stop talking and then be like, oh, you know, I, ha I know someone in my neighborhood who has cancer and they are, they are young, like 30s, 40s. And I'd be like, oh, okay, and why? Oh, I don't know, no one knows. And then we'll literally go silent. Or they will say, well, there has always been cancer and, and change topics, right? And, and this will be very sad and very ab abrupt in a way that in the beginning, I really thought this is completely psychotic, right? These women are telling me that they are really worried about this autochemical fumigations, which from my readings, I knew that harm people because also I have met people that were organizing it against these fumigations, right? So there is scientific evidence and that, 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 that these chemicals do harm people's health. And this, these women that were sprayed constantly, right? Because they live by these farms, they will be curious about it to share their fear with me, but not curious enough to ask, neither to ask me what I think, even though I was, the expert, quote unquote, right? Like I was there to know about these things and they would bring it up, but suddenly remove it out from attention up to the point that as, as those stories that I tell in the book, some of them became completely psychotic, right? Like literally women would shut up instantly or they would say phrases like, um, we don't talk about this, which for, Argenti for any Argentinian that recalls the dictatorship, right? Like this is a strong, like we are, like we as a society are not going to talk about this, even though we uh, we see all this violence. Um, and I have to say that I have to, uh, yes, I have to thank my advisor Ken Gould when when uh, because I emailed this to him, like I don't know what's happening. These people are really crazy, <laughs> uh, and he helped me like figure it out, like, and by reading Stephen Luke's, like trying to figure out what this latent grievance is, uh, were showing up. And he was like, right there, those, that's, what, that's what, what you were looking for, right? Those, those are the latent, latent grievances that you were looking for. And then suddenly the whole story became very visible and it became a true story of gender, which I wasn't, it wasn't in my radar in the, in the first time, because in the first place, because I guess train as a, political economist, like I also had like this very gender view, like, like I had my male view on the thing, like this is not happening. <laughs> like why would gender be an issue? And then suddenly it all became about that. Um, and it is a hinge, a theoretical hinge to, to explain these stories, not only in terms of uh, what the women silence, but also of what the women uh, perceive, right? And trying to understand how, how we could ideally shift uh, from an, um, an appreciation of nature and of agriculture and of production in general move, to move away from the corporate logic of productivity, profits, cost benefit, as you were saying earlier, towards an ethics of care, right? And the precautionary principle, right? To, to uh, following the logic of mothers towards taking care, uh, at very short distance, right, of their progeny, their children, with the goal of long-term sustainability or long-term well-being and happiness. Thank you. I, I had a, a, a double-barreled gender question to follow. Mm -hmm. um, one is related to these half-voiced anxieties by the women of Santa Maria, which is the name you give to the place where you do a lot of your field work. Mm -hmm. The other is that you speak with veterans over the last two decades of the Grupo de Madres de Barrio Vitusa in Goa Nexo in Cordoba and the Mapa de la Muerte, you know, map of the dead that they've constructed. Mm -hmm. Can you help me to understand the space between, in a sense, the very patriarchal experience of those women in Santa Maria versus the extra confidence in speaking out of the Grupo de Madres. That's the first part of the, the gender mm -hmm. question. And the second part is about the Kirchners. 
<laughs> because this enormously powerful quasi Peronista family mm -hmm. that has been so prominent in Argentine politics for the last two decades goes through in your book a shift, remarkable shift from being you know, anti-genetically modified foods with all the concerns that we get about Franken foods and other issues raised by lots of scientists, but also social movements to being Christina in particular, you know, cheerleaders for this, mm -hmm. right? After Nestor has gone, I think. Yeah. So I wonder if you could talk first of all about that gendered issue of the difference between the women of Santa Maria and the women of the Grupo de Madres and secondly, about the Kirchner heterosexual power couple <laughs> and the shift that occurs in their hegemony. All right, that's a very, I'll see what I can do. Uh, I think the first thing to, to uh, think about, and so in the book, I put forward this concept called, the, what I call the synergies of power, right? Like, it, and the idea is to try to, to think through uh, uh, a, a more complex intersectionality, like to try to bring in a more complex intersectionality to environmental justice studies in order to understand the ways in which uh, the different social groupings in which we belong uh, either uh, exacerbate our power, power or our powerlessness, right? And to try to think about that, not only um, in a place in time, but also throughout time, right? And this is why I, I pushed to try to think about this historically, right? It's not, and when when I make the statement that uh, uh, men of European descent who are upper middle class are responsible or have control over farming, this is not something that happens now, but it has a two, two centuries of history, right? And I and I trace that history to explain why why women are not in charge of farming, right? Even though many of them are, have been the daughters of, right? Right. So in terms of their inheritance, they should have, uh, and many of them have inherited land, right? But they don't have a say into uh, what agriculture is. And so the, 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 the mothers that I meet in Santa Maria in this uh, soy town are a very particular group of mothers. They are mothers who are also married into soybeans, right? They are the wives of soybean producers or or they are, um, or or they are not in agriculture per se, right? But they have businesses, right? They are in the secondary sector, right? They have businesses that have benefited greatly because of the soy boom. So, so these women are caught, and I say, and I use this term of the in between, right? They are caught in between in the sense that they are both receiving benefits, right? Particularly their income, out um, from soybeans, but they are also paying the costs because they are living by the farms. They are being sprayed by the agrochemicals. Now, in contrast, the Madres de Barrio de Sanguanexo in Cordoba City, these are a group of mothers that have organized to protest um, against agrochemical spraying because, I mean, for multiple reasons, right? The, the most important reason is because many people in their community, including their own children, have become ill and many died because of agrochemical spraying, right? But, but the other key axis, right? When you're trying to break down all these multiple dimensions of domination and oppression, right? To say it in a sociological way is that these women are not attached. Uh, they, don't, they don't participate in the agribusinesses. These, these are women that are, uh, some of them uh, working class, poor. Uh, they, they, many of them, most of them don't have a history of organizing, political organizing, right? But, neither them nor their families benefit at all from soybean production. So they are more of a classic um, example of, of environmental justice, local grassroots organization. When, when uh, those that are purely exposed to bearing the burden of uh, production organized, right? So, so this is why I think it's interesting to um, try to break this down <laughs> Right to try to break this this uh, multiple aspect beyond class, beyond race, right? Like, but to try to think about settler colonialism historically, of course, gender, think about class and how all those may operate um, 
for a particular person, right? But all that is, I don't know, cut across. Now, in terms of the Kirchners, the Kirchners have been interesting because they have been flipping all along. Um, they have been strong supporters of genetically modified crops all throughout, actually, most particularly because most particularly because soybeans being soybeans are a full third of all foreign exports for Argentina, right? So uh, Nestor Kirchner first became president in 2003 after the, one of the worst, if not the worst economic crisis of Argentina after of 2001. So soybean became a bounty, right? The, in, in another article, I call it something like the goose that lays the golden eggs, right? So even though um, they, they have had, and I mean the Kirchner's together, a very conflicted relationship towards the countryside, El Campo, right? Like the, the agro, the agribusiness sector, they have always, they have never been able to let go because of the weight in the Argentine economy. And it is important to say that the Argentine government collects a full third of all exports, right? So uh, it's a huge chunk of money that they, they cannot just shed really because, and, and this is the history, uh, the history and the present of resource extractivism for all Latin America is that these governments of, le of left and right, even though they might be against extractivism itself, they are too poor to share it, right? So then they become uh, like uh, Rafael Correa said, said in Ecuador, I think 2006, 2007, right? Like we cannot be beggars on a pot of gold, right? We have this gold, we have these mines, we have this forest, like what else? So, so then it's also uh, the, the problem of development, right? Like in general, um, but yeah, I. I don't know if that fully answers the question. No, but thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I don't I, know. Do you so want to open it up? We have twenty minutes. Do you want to? That sounds like a great idea. I don't know if uh, let the audience. Or if anyone has any questions, if no, we just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so they could go to the chat function and write them there, or the questions function, right? Or is that how we would like to do it, perhaps? I think that that should be the best way. Okay. Uh, here comes a question. Oh. Hi, Vicky. Where does this project lead? Um, He's always asking the tough ones. <laughs> yes, why, well, Vicky, you asked the tough ones. Figures, it all goes uh, today. Yes. Uh, this project leads, I have been very uh, um, Lucky, and I'm very thankful for now uh, New Orleans Center for the Gulf South. I'm going to mention Rebecca that I think was there. Uh, I have been studying to, to think about how Argentina connects to this place where I live now, the Gulf South. And after spending a whole summer here in New Orleans being battered by hurricanes, while at the same time, um, our, the, north of, the northeast of Argentina is burning. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm starting to think about the ways in which industrial agriculture in Argentina and also here uh, creates climate, like it's impacting climate change and also try to think about what climate policy might be possible in these areas that, that are so heavily reliant on resource extraction, like this area and oil, but also here in, in New Orleans, we produce nitrogen, like we extract gas and oil from the Gulf South, which pipe this gas into here. We create nitrogen that creates fertilizer that is spread out in the Midwest, then flows down the Mississippi, creates a massive dead zone at the end of the Gulf. Uh, so I'm starting to think about the ways in which the Delta here in Mississippi and the Delta of the Rio Paraná in Argentina are similar uh, and what does that mean? So that's where it leads. I have no idea, but I will have a second research project eventually. <laughs> and there's a, a great question here. One person says, keep going, which is lovely because I love <laughs> Thank the talk. You. Yeah. But then there's a question for you more importantly. 
um, how long into the project did it take before you got the spark of understanding from the women you stayed with, you know, that ethnographic light going off moment? Say that again, I'm sorry, I got lost with reading sorry. questions and now I'm just lost. How long into the project did it take before you got the spark of understanding from the women you stayed with? And how long after that did it take to finish the book? I think Ken Gould, my advisor, was there. Ken, if you're there, thank you so much. He has bear with me all this time. I did a lot of crying in his office. Uh, it, take, it took me a very long time. And I, what I really tried to do in the book um, as well, from the acknowledgments through, throughout the book, was to try to be very transparent into how anxiety reading and how confused I was many of the times. Because something that I found very problematic as I went through the grad school assistant professor experience is that people keep showing you final products. They tell they they show you the final product and, and then they'll and then they give you advice like find your voice. Find your voice. You just need to find your voice. You just need to write it. Oh, the second book is better. And I was like, what? how? What does this mean? Or you just go to the field work and you like to the field and you'll figure it out. I'm like, what? How? Um, so it literally took me a very long time because I started doing my field work in 2009, I believe, in my uh, last year of coursework. Then I wrote the dissertation also thanks to my mom who uh, <laughs> she did a lot of hand holding. Uh, and then I rewrote multiple versions in different articles. So I also benefited very much from people um, like uh, in the peer review process, I, I learned a lot uh, then I was very, very lucky um, and very grateful to the um, School of Liberal Arts and Cyper who helped me have a book workshop that uh, people came, read the book, Pablo La Peña and Shannon Bell came, uh, Laura McKinney, all these people that were like super, Ma Maria Turin, all these people that read my book and they gave me like super generous feedback. Uh, then I also was lucky to get help uh, to uh, have a developmental book editor, Anitra Rizales, if you're there. My thanks to you, someone who read that thing. So um, it, it took me a very long time and I had a lot of people who helped me all throughout, who read me, who read my stuff, gave me feedback, corrected my English, look McAvoy, my partner, like he read absolutely everything. Uh, so I think that uh, see if the question is how long did it take? It took like many, many years. It, it took like so much money and and so above all patience and discipline and i think that personally i think that we should we we should be like disclose that better to the people that we're working with and now that i'm working with students i'm trying to be as transparent as possible to tell them how difficult it is because for some people and i know toby like you write a book like every other week uh, but some of us like, I'm like, oh my God, this is difficult. And and acknowledging all the people that help us all throughout the way, I mean, that have helped me, it takes a very long time and patience is key. And um, that question came from yes. Diego and there's a related one yeah. from Margaret. Okay. Um, if we're a student and want to get involved in research like this slash pursue something like this as a career path, what do you recommend? It sounds as though you recommend loving people with dry shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> what would I recommend? I would say um, begin taking classes with people that you admire or you think that you might um, admire uh, people that um, can help you and just be patient. Keep, keep reading, keep writing, keep reading, keep writing, revising, discipline. Yes, thank you Diego for the question. Yeah, that one was from Margaret and then we've got Camilo asking, can you say more about what other ethnographers might take methodologically from your experience? For it seems like you're able to exploit a hybrid identity in surprising ways. You're a woman which gave you access to the backstage, but your social scientific expertise and university affiliation seem to have coded as male, vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. the male agronomists and farmers. Though there is one female agronomist, I yeah. think, that you commune with very powerfully. Can yeah. any aspects of this be transposed onto other ethnographic contexts? Asks Camilo. Um, I would hope so. I mean, I have to say, and, and again, for the full, for full disclosure, I, this did not begin as an ethnography, mostly because of the way in which um, graduate school research is possible 
right? Like you only have time during the summer. So I never, and because of, I was hoping I would capture multiple different towns. I didn't stay as long as I, most, most people that do ethnography stay on the field, right? Like they have this multi-month experience and, and suddenly, so this is why sometimes I don't even say, fully say that that is a, like this is an ethnography off, right? Like this, this I, I'm very, um, I am transparent that I'm you, you pulling from multiple methods, one of which is this uh, participant observation, right? And I'm, and I'm also disclosing that this happened in this town and it didn't happen on the others, not because I don't think it's not happening because I've had the experience and once was this with you, Toby, remember, uh, during the Cultural Studies Association when we did this presentation and, and one there was one speaker on the in the audience saying, oh, this happens in my town, right? And the more that I talk about this, I, I've been hearing from people that I'm like, oh, wow, this has been happening in my town too, that people talk about this, but they don't, and they don't protest, but they're worried. So I have the instinct that this is happening every other, in many other places, but I haven't tested it, right? Like, because I haven't done all that, um, but I do think that uh, to answer, if there's something that I can answer about that question, I I think that the the teaching, right, or what I want to share about the process of doing uh, doing this qualitative research and 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 telling about it is that we have to be very very conscious or much more aware of what we bring in and like what do our, our bodies look like for the other person because that discloses a lot of information that not, might not be disclosed for other people. So um, in that sense, uh, as um, Camilo was saying, let's say, yeah, I, I show up as, as the masculine, right? As, as, as the researcher from a foreign university that is coming in and asking all these questions and I'm talking to the men, right? I am like, I have the questions for the agronomist, for the agribusiness director, for the CEO. And, 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 but then suddenly I do become a woman that is potentially a mother um, that is like these other people. And that gave me insider status with a other group of people that, that, that if any other person um, would have showed up or a man, for example, like that wouldn't have happened. Um, so I think that the, the, the lesson is just to, to try to think on the ways in which, and I'm, I, it's not just me saying this, right? Like a lot of, most people that do ethnography like are very much aware that what, what we get from the field is a response to who we are. Like there's no objective observer <laughs> out there. Um, You've stimulated an enormous number of questions. So I'm going to try to get us to <laughs> okay. time left. Rebecca wants to know the place of soy in the Argentine diet in contrast to the wheat and beef of the previous agro export boom. Yeah, so this is the interesting thing about Argentina is that we don't eat soybeans. Uh, we don't. And, and I think that that was one of the keys of why there is not. I mean, this is growing and changing from since I finished my field work in 2015. Now there is a growing number of concerned consumers, urban citizens that are talking about, uh, I would say agrotoxicos, like toxic agrochemicals that are talking about genetically modified crops. There are lots of people writing about this, uh, Soledad Barruti in particular, right? Like people that have become our own version of Michael Pollan. <laughs> uh, so, but the interesting thing when I started my field work in 2008, 2009, is that urban citizens would like sh shove off the problem of soybeans because that is happening somewhere else, right? Like that's not happening here. Like the farms are somewhere else. And also we don't eat it. We don't, Argentines don't eat soybeans. 96% of all these soybeans grown are exported uh, to China or the European Union, mostly as animal feed. And, uh, and Argentines don't have it in their culture, in our culture to eat this thing, like we eat meat, like soy tofu, 
it's only very, 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 very limited. Uh, so I think that that one is um, one key of the puzzle of why there hasn't been a broad national uh, a, a network against genetically against genetically modified crops. And one of the keys is because, well, we don't need it. So one of the main costs that may harm your health, which is through eating this thing, um, it's just not happening. And that actually answered, answers Francesca's question about where it ends up. Um, mm -hmm. now, I don't know if I'm correctly, correctly pronouncing Devin's name, D-E-V-I-N. Devin, 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 yes. Devin. Well, <laughs> getting back to the gender issue and the researcher one, could you speak to the role of young unmarried women, if you have any data to speak to that? Devon is thinking of the prominence of youth participation in the US environmental justice movement like Sunrise. So what's mm. it, are there young unmarried women who are involved in activism? Yes, I have met, I have many young people in general, both men and women who are um, involved in the stop spraying movement. Uh, and the interesting thing is that most of them are students, right? University students. So they have left the rural town to move into the capital to study. They have learned about these problems and that now they're back in their town trying to um, organize and create. And this is very important. This is um, the, the, in the entire chapter on movement chapter four uh, talks about, I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm bringing up all the, the, um, the movements against agrochemical spraying and the ways in which they are creating, they are challenging expert science, the expert science that tells them there's nothing wrong with genetically modified crops, there's nothing wrong with agrochemicals, right? Uh, they, are, they are bringing up ways, and as you mentioned, this Mapa de la Muerte, this map of the dead, right? Like to, to map out this, um, these health hazards and they are creating alliances with, um, with um, ally scientists, lawyers, people from the universities, right, that are um, helping them frame a popular epidemiology, right, to, that, that challenges not only expert science, but also political economy of soybeans. And, and, and there are many young girls there. Um, but, but this is not a, as widespread as the youth climate movement here. However, the interesting thing that is happening in Argentina, and this is separate, uh, is that the girls are girls and women are organizing against um, or or for abortion rights. So the the the, the ways in which uh, youth activism is happening in Argentina, the 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 climate movement is growing, uh, but the feminist movement is growing. So if Devin, you're interested in girls organizing, that's something very, very exciting that is happening in Argentina, Chile, Mexico, all across the region now. Now, Prof, what I'd like to do, because we've only got a few minutes left, is mm -hmm. put together the remaining questions for you. So you might want to take a note okay. of Okay, <laughs> all minutes. right, yes. So, Handy wants to know, how would you envisage the book being inserted in the environmental history of Latin America? Okay. Reagan wants to know, whether these agricultural towns have a big indigenous population. Okay. In Liat, is that correct? I hope that's correct. Mm. Hola, Liat. How did the men respond to you centering your interviews on the women later on in your field research? Were there social implications? Mm. Uh, Brian asks, what lessons do you think your research offers for GMO activists in the global north? for whom technology has always been the sort of center. David or David asks, sometimes we hear the narrative that GM soy and other products crowd out smaller farmers. Is that the case in the Argentine experience? Say, say that again. Sometimes we hear the narrative that GM soy and other products crowd out smaller farmers. Is yes. that true for the Argentine experience and what came out from your discussions with farmers? Mm -hmm. And the last one, there are lots of highs and congratulations, comes, from Kenneth, comes from Kenneth Lee. That's my advice, so thank you, Ken. I know, <laughs> his name, so you'd better answer this one. Mm -hmm. Is there an opening in the political opportunity structure in Argentina to define organic agroecological practices as the next wave of modern, in inverted commas, agriculture? Mm. 
Okay, we have three minutes and I'm going to try. Uh, Handy, uh, the history, how does it fit in the environmental history of Latin America? I do, um, this is my first chapter is that I trace the, the, the taming of nature starting from um, Domingo Faustino Sarmiento, this idea of the, the conceptions of civilization and barbarism, um, how, how that becomes Argentina's national identity as, as a way to, as a project to build the nation uh, towards taming, taming nature, taming the Pampas, taming the indigenous people. And, and that becomes a project, right? Becomes a project of the liberal elites of the time. And that, that exact same project was happening in Argentina, in Mexico, in Colombia, and also here in the United States, right? With the westward expansion. I'm going to be with Chris Lane in that course next semester, so we'll talk about it. Uh, Liad, indigenous populations, the, no, um, I'm sorry, Reagan, indigenous populations. The interesting thing about uh, the Pampas in Argentina, which is the sector that grows the most soybeans, is that there is no indigenous population. I mean, or it's very, very small. And that's something that is a history that I trace across the book because it is it answers one part of the puzzle, right? Of why, like, who are the people who are in charge of production? and why is it that they are upper and middle class men of European descent? And, and this displacing and erasing the indigenous history, the indigenous peoples and indigenous, indigenous from Argentine history is one key. Um, Liad, how, how did the men respond? Um, men ignore, either ignore health hazards or they completely denied them, telling me that that uh, the women who protest are hysterical, housewives who don't know nothing, uh, irrational, right? So using completely gender gender language and completely dismissing this, using the language of science, saying this has been proved, we know everything. Done. Uh, Brian, hello, Brian. Uh, what are the lessons to GMO activists? I don't know. I have to think about that. I think I, I think that an important lesson to to for all of us is to think about the ways that it is important for us to think about the ways in which um, GMOs do benefit, which is something that we may not want to hear, right? But the problem with soybeans is that they do benefit Argentina econ Argentina's economy and a lot of the population through this export taxation and. And we need to be very, very mindful of that uh, because the problem with I find with activism and sociologists, and I include myself, is that we can become so clear how this is bad and we stop hearing the ways in which this is good. And so we might need to find different ways like to propose uh, something else. And this ties me to Ken's question, like what is the opening of the political opportunity to create uh, alternative project it's not there. I, unfortunately, I mean, there are examples of uh, agroecological um, projects taking place, but I think that because of this huge economic crisis that Argentina is in, that's not going to happen. So the political economy is closed. And lastly, uh, David's question about what happens with smallholder farmers or small farmers like being invaded by the genetically modified soy from larger farmers. That's also not happening because there are no smallholder farmers. <laughs> like, uh, and this is something that I also trace in this long history of Argentina is that the campesino, or the smallholder farmer as, as this typical Latin American uh, ca category of grower is not there in the Pampas, right? Uh, the, the, the history of agro exporting in Argentina has a farmer that is more like the American type of farmer, like heavily, capitalized, growing for profit, and, and either middle or large scale, because otherwise you cannot do it. Um, so I hope well, that that was quick enough. By the yes. Judging by the reactions generated in the audience, we could have uh, used easily another hour <laughs> more to talk about the book, but we uh, scheduled one, so we have to end it here. Um, and I uh, just want to reiterate my thanks. Uh, Toby, excellent job moderating and, and leading this discussion and you got every question in, that's admirable. Uh, Amalia, uh, what can I say? You are the star and um, you. you performed like one. Uh, 
Um, and uh, we're very, uh, very proud to have hosted this event. And we thank all uh, of those who um, joined us and uh, stay tuned uh, for our next one. Uh, thank you all again and uh, see you thank next you. time. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for the questions and for making this easy. <laughs> see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.